about four or five times. It's always really nice coming. Uh, and in the audience, there's always at least one of my students. So raise your hand if you're one of my students in the past. There we go, Francis Bach. And uh, as someone who's my same age has just arrived in the room too, which is nice to have uh, an old person. Oh, you know, you're younger. <laughs> I won't make any comments further about that. All right, so. Um, yeah, so this is a new section. I guess that this is going to include Francis and Jan and, and some others. So a little bit more on the machine learning side, uh, and also a little bit more on the engineering side. Uh, so I'm going to actually start by talking about what really are the goals of the field that we're in. What field are we in, actually? So, you know, we can just, we like mathematics, so we're kind of mathematicians, and we use our tools from various places and try to solve math problems. So that's fine. Um, but we're also having a big impact on society and uh, as kind of an engineering uh, effort. And we should think more about what that impact is and what we want it to be, what it could be. I don't believe it's enough to just solve intelligence. That, I don't, that didn't mean anything to me. I, I don't think we're going to do that in hundreds of years. Um, and even if you solved intelligence, we have lots of intelligent, we have seven billion intelligent creatures on the, on the world, in the world. It's more, what do you do with them? And um, how do we add to that? And what, what, what are we trying to build? So we're not solving intelligence, we're trying to augment intelligence. We're trying to make humans happier and safer and all that. So how do we think about those issues in the context of mathematics and algorithms? So when I think about these things, it's definitely not just machine learning in the classical sense. And I'm going to kind of say a little bit of what I think machine learning is. Uh, again, trying to talk about what or why are we doing what we're doing. Um, and so it definitely has to start to include economics, because if you're going to have agents making decisions, they're always in the context of other decision makers, right? And they're always in the context of scarcity. There's, everybody wants to do the same thing. Well, you can't have everybody do the same thing. You have to have trade-offs. You have to design those and think through those trade-offs. And that's what economists do, microeconomists. And so if you don't think about that as you're designing your machine learning system, you're going to throw it out in the world, and a lot of agents will use it, and it's going to fail. You're going to have some serious failures. So we've already had a lot of those in the real world. Uh, so economics is full of cool math, lots of fixed point work, um, and what it's kind of missing often is the data and learning side. It's a lot of assumptions are made and then things are, are done. So we're going to try to pull together decision dynamics, that's where some of the physical science kind of ideas will come in, but certainly incentives and mechanism design, which is the economic side. All right, so that's going to be my goal. Um, so machine learning. Um, I don't think it's a new field, personally. I think it's a, basically an engineering discipline that emerged out of statistics meets computer science. You blended those two efforts. That's my perspective. Others think, well, we studied the brain and that became machine learning. I don't, aspire, I don't believe that, but um, there are people that tell that story. Um, I believe that what it is is the field of pattern recognition, which is sort of an effort in the 60s coming from electrical engineering and, and, and statistics. Um, but, but put together with decision making. So these are at least the two sides. Um, if you don't have the two sides, you're not really doing a, a full, you're not, you're not ready to deploy something in the real world. Uh, pattern recognition, um, as you know, has become hot uh, in the last, say, decade. Uh, it's become a commodity. You can download software that'll do this at sort of essentially arbitrary scale. Um, and you've been learning a lot about this the past two weeks. What are the challenges? And, you know, it's not finished, but it's certainly become a commodity. Um, all right, now I'm going to emphasize the other side of the field, which is decision making. And um, I'm going to argue very strongly, as strongly as I can, that, that pattern recognition is not enough, that it's not, it's only not even half of enough. It, it, um, it, it, it's, uh, so there's a decision making side, in particular when you start talking about all these kind of things, high stakes decisions, not just is there a bunny in the image or not, and I make an error, who cares? It's like a medical decision, I might die if I make the wrong decision. Or lots and large, large numbers of people that die if you deploy something that doesn't work. Um, and explanations, multiple decisions, and in particular, we start to get into multiple decision makers and there's kind of interactions and scarcity, um, then we're going to have to bring in economics ideas, okay? So I want to emphasize the decision making side of this field, and I'm going to emphasize that it's not just thresholding the output of a pattern recognition system. Uh, so for, before I get there, let's talk a little about some of the challenges in pattern recognition. These are just kind of a short list of the ones you'll see in a lot of the conferences nowadays. We, we, we recognize pattern recognition has made a lot of progress, but there's still some things to solve. You know, and certainly uncertainty, we're still kind of at a loss, really. You can have the outputs of these systems, and, and it's still very ad hoc and heuristic about what, what, what's the uncertainty in your output, okay? Um, and you can go to statistics and talk about the bootstrap or asymptotics or jackknife and all that, but those things often don't scale. 
uh, at the scale that we're really interested in. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about progress there, and some, some new ideas that allow us to think about that. Uh, but really, the notion of confidence is not just kind of a Gaussian error bar. It's really, what's the uncertainty in your prediction? And where's that uncertainty coming from? Is it because the data was collected 10 years ago? or collected on different machines than you know, your current machine, and, and all the sources of uncertainty that as human beings we think about when we make decisions, we need our systems to be able to, to, to be explicit about that. And then these other things like robustness, adversaries, bias, fairness, explain it. Those have become the topics du jour. Um, I would argue as, start, as soon as you start to get into these things, you're talking about people, right? And, and, and systems with people. And so it starts to become economic. And if you don't think about the economic side of this, well, what does economics do bring here? Well, partly trade-offs. Okay, like, like privacy. Is it just an absolute, the algorithm guarantees me privacy and I'm happy or not? No. It's a trade-off. I'll give up a little privacy if you give me something in return. That's how we as humans behave in all kinds of situations. I give a little risk uh, in, our, in my life for various returns. Adventures, risk. And so we want to quantify the loss against the gain from learning systems. Okay, so I believe that, uh, so decision theory, I think you all know what it is. Game theory, I think you know what it is. Mechanism design is inverse game theory. And that's where we're, we're all, because we're engineering minded, we often try to solve inverse problems. And so mechanism design is the inverse problems of, of microeconomics. Okay, so let's, let's, let's uh, push this issue about decisions a little bit more. All right, so let's imagine that you've gone into the doctor's office next in five years, and um, the doctor has a neural net that's been trained on all the world's medical data. All the hospitals have come together and everybody's data has been put in there and it's been trained on huge amounts of medical data. It's the world's best prediction system for, for disease. Okay, and so the doctor has that. And so the doctor then measures, um, you know, a 100,000 dimensional covariate for you. Uh, you know, maybe your height, your weight, your blood pressure, but also your genome and also all kinds of other measurements on your body. And that 100,000 dimensional feature vector goes into the big neural net. And the big neural net makes really good predictions based on past data about your state of health. All right, so that may be true soon enough. All right, so now let's think that through a little bit. What is that gonna mean for your uh, situation? Um, so let's suppose that one of the outputs of the neural nets is the prediction about your, your heart. Uh, so if, if on, based on the historical data, if the prediction is above 0.7, it suggests you're about to have a heart attack and you should operate, okay? Um, now, are you gonna, how seriously are you going to take that prediction? Is that a decision in any sense? Okay. Uh, well, no. So, so first of all, uh, suppose your prediction comes back as 0.701. And 0.7 is the threshold. You're above the threshold. Yes, you've got the operation. No, you're, the first thing you do is ask the doctor, well, what's your uncertainty about that? How sure are you about of my 0.701? All right, in particular, where did the data come from that delivered that 0.701? Don't just give me the big black box. Tell me where the data came from. Because maybe the data came from 10 years ago and things have changed. Or maybe there's different machines used that I, I was using a new machine. Or maybe the data was collected on people that are very different from me. Or maybe blah, 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 blah. We can go on and on and on about how relevant that prediction is to me. And, and that gives me bigger and bigger error bars. you think that through. So that's number one. But even more importantly, at that moment, you're gonna remember all kinds of things. You're gonna have a little conversation in the context of that result. You're gonna say, oh gosh, I'd forgotten but I had asthma as a kid, maybe that's relevant to this heart thing. Or, or my parents had heart disease, I didn't ever tell anybody, we forgot about it, but you know. Um, or then you're gonna start doing what if experiments. You're gonna say, what if I were to exercise more? What if I were to yeah, eat differently with the doctor? And the doctor will then take into account the output plus his, the doctor's knowledge and there will be a little dialogue back and forth of counterfactuals. And counterfactuals are things that could have been true but weren't, so they aren't in that data. So now you have to realize that that big neural net does not have all the world's medical data. That's a meaningless statement, okay? Because in the moment of having a result, you're gonna have a dialogue that's gonna bring new data to bear that was not seeming to be relevant ever before. And that happens all the time for all of our decisions. Data that was not seeming relevant before suddenly becomes highly relevant in the context of a particular decision and the context of a particular set of results, okay? So that's usually called reasoning, not learning. Um, you know, and, and do our systems reason? No, they do not. They're terrible at it. But that's what you want to do with the doctor. And a good doctor will sit you down and you'll reason about that result. And maybe you'll look at a second test. Maybe you'll do some what-if experiments or this and that. And you'll come up with a plan for the actual decision. Okay, that's much more like real-world decision-making. Okay, and the neural net there can play a little role of kind of helping you know, orient that discussion. You can then add some data to the neural net and run the counterfactual. All right, and make some other predictions in the context of a counterfactual. All right, so that's starting to feel better to me. 
all right? It's not just the threshold of a neural net. All right, but, but that's just one decision, <laughs> right, that has consequences that you really care about. The fact is I'm making multiple decisions today uh, at different time scales. What do I do right in this moment? What am I going to do later today? What am I going to do with my children? What are we going to do next week? Uh, what am I going to do in this part of my life? What decisions am I making about my career? Et cetera, et cetera. They're all layered on top of each other, and I'm making all those decisions. They're all important. And I'm kind of gathering data actively, and I'm conditioning, and I'm reasoning about that as I, as I, as I proceed. So we're not just taking a big black box and filling it full of things and making predictions. Okay, so this is maybe obvious, but you know, you read about these foundation models and all that, you, you, you get the story that you're just going to build these really big neural nets, and they're going to really make perfect predictions, and then you're good to go. Okay. All right, moreover, I'm not just making decisions for myself. I'm making decisions that impact you guys, and you're making decisions that impact me. Um, and more and more of that's happening, not just in our kind of local world, social world here, but um, say in the world of transportation. What I do affects you. In the world of healthcare, we just had a pandemic. We still have a pandemic. In that pandemic, um, you know, someone tested something on you, and it worked. That propagates to other people who, who then start to use it. Uh, so data is flowing across the entire planet about what's working, what's not, and what decisions seem to be good ones and what's are bad ones, and slowly but surely that network starts to make better decisions. Okay? And there's trade-offs here. You can't do everything for everybody. So you gotta think about all those trade-offs. All right. So I hope you're a little bit convinced at least that this is really interesting. It's mathematical too. We'll talk about the mathematics that we'll need, you'll need to underlie this, and it includes some economics ideas and statistics ideas and computer science ideas, and of course physics and control theory and so on and so forth. All right, so to make this even a little bit more concrete, let's think about probably the most successful pattern recognition systems ever. Those are recommendation systems. They've, you know, billion dollar industry has emerged out of that. Okay, it's not just in the future, it's already happened. Um, all right, so you, know, you all know what they are. You buy some books at Amazon. Um, it somehow uses a pattern recognition system to predict what other books you might like. Okay, maybe based on other, other customers' purchases. Um, and they become a commodity as well. All right, they're part of the prediction side. They make good predictions, okay? Should we think of those as decisions? Again, no, we should not. And so let's think about a little bit the, the history of this. So um, these were early rolled out in places like Amazon and Netflix. So suppose you're, you're Netflix and you're recommending a certain movie, okay? Now, um, if this is only being done with a few people, you know, um, it's first of all not gonna be very good predictions. As, as you get more and more people, the predictions will get better. Right? But you're not going to try to account for all the interactions. You're just going to kind of get a matrix and factorize it. You know, you're going to do something simple. For everybody who comes into the system, you'll put that into some network, and it'll make a prediction for that person. You'll give them the prediction. Okay? And you won't then later in the day make a different prediction be because someone else came in earlier. It's just too complicated. All right. So it's quite possible that you could recommend the same movie to 100,000 people in a given day. And that happens all the time at Netflix, of course popular movies. And is that a problem? Well, there's no, there's no scarcity inside the computer. You can copy the bits as much as you want. And this is kind of a little bit the mindset in computer science that I don't have scarcity, I can, copy, you know, I can copy bits as much as I want. In fact, with books, Amazon, same story. Amazon can and does recommend the same book to 100,000 people in a given day. And a lot of people will buy it, push that button. And there's something called print on demand that made the scarcity go away. You can print that within a few hours and ship it to somebody within you know, now basically a day or two days. Okay? So you'd, you'd be forgiven to think that this is kind of the future, that we just can copy things and we have enough resources that we can make everything available to everybody that they want. We don't have to worry about any of these things. All right, but now you, you start to see other applications of this, and you start to realize, oops, there's a problem. So in fact, I saw this in China. They were using recommendation systems. To, there was a company that had emerged in Shanghai that was doing restaurant recommendations, and it was pretty good. Um, um, and it was just a recommendation system because the software was being used. And it was, so it was being used by, you know, not a huge number of people, but a certain number of people, everyone was kind of liking it. I used it, I liked it, because I went to Shanghai and I didn't know what I was speaking Mandarin. And I was by myself and at 7 p.m. and I wanted to find a restaurant. And so if I could go do a search on Google behind the firewall or Baidu or whatever, and say, good restaurant in Shanghai. And I'd get total nonsense, of course. And I didn't want to be in the moment there of looking at a browser and thinking through that. What, what did I want? Well, I wanted to be more like in a market where I entered into the market and said, look, here I am, geolocate me, I permit you to know a few facts about me, I like Mandarin cuisine or I like Sichuan cuisine and I have a certain price point and I have certain other factors about me, like in any recommendation system. And that information doesn't just give me a list of restaurants, that goes to the other side of the market. The other side of the market is all the restaurants who are looking to fill their seats in that moment. 
And they get not just my request, they get 100,000 other requests. Okay? And now how do we structure that market? Because data is being used to structure it on both sides. It's not just a classical matching market. They didn't think about it this way. Instead, they said, this is just a recommendation system. Let's just recommend restaurants to people based on their browsing history or their past or whatever, all the data we have. So, so they did. And uh, pretty soon, the app got more and more popular. And pretty soon, you know what happens. They recommended the same restaurant to uh, 10,000 people. Okay? And you know, many of them showed up, and there's a line down the street. This literally happened, and it happened more and more. As the system got bigger and bigger and bigger, it got worse and worse and worse. All right, and now you can think through other problems that are also kind of well known. If you have a system that predicts what's the best route to the airport, the fastest, uh, if you know everybody's using the app, you're now going to send everybody down that same route, you'll create congestion. All right, so this is obvious, and there's other implications, you, know, you know, recommending stock purchases in China. This happened where they started to recommend stock purchases to people who had a little bit of money, and you could easily recommend the same stock purchase to three million billion people and the price of that stock goes up and you destabilize the market. And so this is actually part of the discussion inside the Chinese government. All right, so um, how do you fix this? Uh, again, it's kind of in some sense obvious, but the, the mindset I think of the computer science world was, well, we, it's a load balancing problem. We just gotta make sure that we don't send too many people to you know, each, each restaurant. All right, so instead of sending 10,000 people, we just won't let that happen. We'll only send 100 people there and we'll send other people other places. Who do we send to the, which place? Okay. Well, oh, we know a lot about you from your browsing history, right? We know which restaurant you really most prefer. That's the mindset. Okay. We collect so much data on you that we know what, what restaurant you most prefer. And then Francis, we collect a lot of data on him. We know he prefers that other restaurant, so we'll send him there and send me here. I hope you realize how dumb that is. Um, you know, in the moment, I don't know what restaurant I prefer. I have a little bit of preference, but I might say, let's be adventurous today, or I have some friends going there. You know, all kinds of things will come in, you know, very flexible thinking that I'll be engaged in, reasoning about where I might want to go. And, and that's more like entering into a market instead of just entering into a prediction system that tells me where to go. Okay? Same thing for routes to the airport. You know, I, today I might be w wanting to see different routes, you know, Mont Blanc. I, I might want to, maybe it costs more to go on the fastest route and I don't want to spend the money today, I'll save it for another day, you know, and so on. So that's more, again, like a market, like an, almost an auction. All right, so um, is this just kind of like microeconomics? You know, yeah, sort of, but microeconomics has a surprising lack of learning or data, okay? So the, the, the two-way markets you have are mostly that everyone knows the preferences a priori, you write them down, and you do a matching based on those preferences. Now you can ask the question, well, what if you don't know the preference already? Maybe you're doing a banded algorithm to find what you prefer, which gives you the highest reward. How do you put that into a two-way market? That's an interesting mathematical challenge. All right, so hopefully you see that the alternative here is not to create just a big prediction box, but to create a two-way market. And when I say create, this is hard. This is something that some companies can do. And it's not a total mystery. Something like Uber has done this, right? It's, it's a kind of, they don't do a very good job. It's a bad two-way market, and they're losing money. Um, but, you know, you have riders and drivers, and there's a little transaction, you know, so there's producers and consumers, and uh, there's a matching. Yeah? Yeah. You decouple the market from the learning or recommendation where basically you reveal all of the information to both the parties and then separately uh, they, uh, they, they enter into a market. Yeah. And uh, are you thinking of somehow revealing only partial information to some... I, I, I think I like a real market that uh, it's very decentralized. I don't want a central platform doing any of it. So I literally want to take out my cell phone. I'm in Shanghai. I want to push a button saying, I'm hungry. All right? And now some information about me goes into the market. Not everything about me, not my whole browsing history, but what food I've eaten in the past, maybe. All right? And um, it geolocates me. It sends that vector into the market. All right? Um, the other side of the market then looks at my vector, and it looks at their current business model. Or, you know, they also have a little bit of recommendation system on their side. What do they prefer? All right? And, uh, and online, a matching is made. And what a matching means, it doesn't just assign me to the restaurant. It, 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 there's a bid off, you know, that comes across the market. So I get a beak, beam, beak, beep on my cell phone, and I see a picture of a restaurant, and I see maybe a 10% discount if you come in the next 10 minutes. And I see you know, the picture of the food, and I see where it is, and I say, yeah, that looks great. I accept. That's what I have in mind. And I have in mind doing that online, adaptively, at any scale, and all that. And I don't see how ever separating out the learning side from the matching side would make any sense in that kind of world. 
imagine that you basically there are two phases that, that might be invisible to you. Where yeah. the first phase is that the, the system gives you your utility function, yeah. uh, your, your utility probability, what would be the utility for the different things. And then yeah. the second phase is that you do the bidding and... Yeah, I mean, you could, you, could, you could make it a more different economic system. I mean, I have one in mind that I think is the simplest one. Uh, but I just want to make sure that you think about, think about economies, how they work. They work on um, scales of centuries, decades. They adapt at any scale. Small city, you know, the food that comes into Les Ouches every day. There's enough food for the restaurants and all that. That's a market that did that, right? But that same market works in Paris, and it's worked 100 years ago. And it's worked... Uh, Think about all of our intelligent systems. They work for about a day until they're out, you know, we're out of, the data is shifted and we're not getting good predictions and all. Markets are very, very adaptive. They also have very decentralized behavior. They scale well. And they can start small and get bigger. So I want to bring all that into learning. I don't want to somehow a little bit wall off. So y'all think you're suggesting it's really walling off. But yeah, there are multiple ways to think about this. That's what mechanism design is. We have this new field emerging, which is learning-based mechanism design. And your creativity and mine and everybody else's is going to be needed in structuring that. I just want to make sure that I really bring the full flavor of the mechanisms I'm probably together with, the full flavor of learning, whatever that means. Um, so I've actually been doing this with a, with, with in the context of a company. Um, so the music world is one I care about. I'm also a musician. And um, uh, the music world is, uh, seems to be as healthy as it's ever been in history because there's more songs being made by a factor of 100 than ever before in history, and there's more musicians or people making music by a factor of 1,000. All right, why is that? Well, the laptop. You know, this permits a 16-year-old to learn how to make a song and produce it and master it on the laptop, and it really is really good. All right, now here's the amazing thing, that if you look at that, you look at the flow of data, 90% um, of the songs being listened to today in any country are songs being, that have been written in the last six months and have been written by people you never heard of. 90%. So it's not that everyone's listening to uh, the Beatles and Beyonce or whatever, some people, but a very small fraction. So who are all these people? Well, it's basically 16, 18, and 20 year olds, and they're the ones creating the music and they're the ones listening to it. And they share each with each other what's the cool thing to be listening to and all that, and they're not listening to Beyonce. They're listening to each other as music in some sense. All right? And there are people making this stuff. Um, and so you think, this is great. Wow, this is wonderful. And it's not great because there's no market here at all. What's happening is that a 16-year-old is coming home, making a really good song, putting it up on SoundCloud, say, or some other site, and it's just a stream of bits at that point. The computer scientist lost the economic value. It just became a stream of bits. That gets streamed with Spotify or other services, and eventually people listen to it. The money's gone. There's no economic value being recorded in the system anymore. So uh, Spotify has got to create some economic value to have a company, so what they do is they create an artificial advertising market or a subscription market. All right? That's artificial in the sense they created a, you know, a producer-consumer relationship between them and some other people who want to advertise, and they made a lot of money. All right? uh, now, with all that money, what do they do? Well, they give a little bit of it back to the influencers, so-called, but they decide who the influencers are, and they give only a little bit. And there's, that's not a market. Okay? That's a, you know, an, an oligopoly. All right? So how would you fix this? All right? You got all this data, you got all these huge numbers of people, uh, how would you fix this? Well, you know, the first uh, way to think about this, it's really pretty straightforward. So um, let's suppose that, um, you know, Jan is a musician. You may not know that he plays saxophone. He, suppose, he suppose he's creating a lot of songs and they're pretty good. And a lot of people are listening to them. And so what Jan gets is at the end of the week, he has a map of the United States. And there's a dot every time one of his songs has been listened to. And so he discovers that, you know, in um, Orlando, Florida, 10,000 people listened to his songs last week. He's pretty popular down there for whatever reason. Someone liked it and told their friends and all that. He didn't know that. He sees that and he says, wow, that's pretty cool. And he shows that, he points to the venue owners down in Orlando. He says, look, I'm popular down in your city. And moreover, I know who's listening to me. There's a connection. I'm in a market. And they say, wow, that's cool. Why don't you come down and give a show? He does and he makes $20,000. That's what you can make, all right? Um, you do that three times during the year, you start to have a salary. All right? That's a salary. And so y'all can forget the Facebook gig. Finally, <laughs> and do something much more healthy for society. <laughs> Sorry, Jan, I'm going to tease you from time to time. But uh, um, all right, now, so is this kind of just? First of all, is this hard? Yeah, it's hard to make that thing and to, to make this be a structured, really good market for the long tails and make sure everyone's fairly served and make this adaptive and all. That's hard. 
But anyway, Steve Stout is a famous person in the hip-hop world. He was actually the producer of, of Kanye West and all that. He's really famous in that world. Um, and he and I met up, and we talked about this, and we had the same perspective. Why don't we create a market here instead for musicians instead of just you know, a streaming service or, or, a, or a recommendation service? So this happened, and this is called United Masters. You can go look at the website. It's a very cool website. And you will find there that there are two million musicians in the United States, uh, some of the best. Um, not the famous ones, Beyonce's not on, although she could be if she wanted, but there's lots of other up-and-coming artists who are really good who are only on that website. They didn't sign with a record company. All right? And what does that mean to be on that website? Well, um, this website has got this little you know, record company in a pocket sort of idea that you, they will help you produce and master your songs and they will put them on the, on the web. But even more important than you're in a market. So um, Steve went to the NBA, National Basketball Association, he knows people there, and says, you guys, when you play your clips of the, the games of the week, there's always music behind them. I know, I see that you're using, you know, Beyonce's music, where I know you're spending a lot of money on that. Why don't you use the United Masters artists instead? They're much more cool and younger, and everyone thinks they're cool. Huh? And, and so the NBA said, yeah. So they signed a contract. And so now if you go to the NBA website and you watch a clip, you listen to music, it's from the United Masters artists. Now, that means there's been a two-way market. It's actually three ways now. Producer, you know, listener, and brand. All right? And so um, when you listen to music, money gets paid by the NBA back to uh, the, the, the artist. And so the artist now, instead of getting you know, a small you know, 5%, they get 90%. And they're making a salary literally just from that. All right? And they get highlighted in some of the brands like that artist. They make a separate contract. It's now a market. It's a living, breathing market. The artists also know who's listening to them. They make offers. I'll come play at your daughter's wedding for $20,000 and so on. So there's 2 million young kids who are now having a career. All right? And we did that. That's machine learning and microeconomics. And it's not even heavyweight algorithms, I can tell you. It's pretty simple stuff. All right. Um, so that's in the U.S. This could obviously be done in Brazil and Africa and India and China. And the companies that do this are going to be making a lot of money. But they're not going to be making all the money. The artists are going to be making a lot of the money. Okay? So we can create new markets, and that can be healthy for society. So we're not like creating an AI system that writes music. That's a fine goal. If anyone in the room is doing that, you know, more power to you. Um, but what I want to do is to help humans be happier and more productive and have jobs. I don't want to take away jobs and then figure out later how to restore them, make everybody into a computer programmer. I want to let people do what they want to do, which is make music. All right, and so you can do this for other things, too. Um, imagine that, you know, you do this for um, um, art. So I've got a new house, and on that wall I'd like to have a painting. I can put out a bid in the market, and, you know, 10,000 people around the world can say, I can paint a painting for that wall. And I look at the bids, and I make a decision. We do this for journalism. Um, you know, next week I'm traveling to Sri Lanka, you know, um, I don't have any idea about it, I don't want to read a browser, you know, web page. Uh, will someone in Sri Lanka look at me and say, oh, I'm a, you know, 60-year-old person, um, I know what this person will like, and I'll write a little one-page document for that person, and I'll, I'll pay $50. Okay, so I can do micro, these are called, this is called the creator economy sometimes, this is one of the few buzzwords from Silicon Valley that I like. Um, yeah. You're my, pro my provocation. <laughs> uh, there's about 12 million small businesses, yeah. uh, most of which are uh, yeah. type, uh, yeah. on Facebook that survived just because of Facebook. So Facebook yeah. Is, yeah, no, no, I, I, that was, you did pro pro respond to my, you got very defensive there, Jan, just to say. <laughs> and, and you know, um, so, yeah. I'm not sure it would be that good to the world if uh, anyone actually listened to my music, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, no, so big companies do good things and do some bad things. And I think that you've got to think about if you're going to build your own company or work with people that do, you've got to think about the business model. And so, you know, Amazon is another place to think about. Are they good and bad for the world? Well, there's both. Uh, Amazon brings packages to people. They create markets. They have companies there that wouldn't survive otherwise, as does Facebook. Um, uh, but I do think that the advertising um, thing that a lot of us as machine learning have kind of built, by, bought into, that we create dollars by uh, advertising, has been not so healthy. And um, it led to then huge amounts of money, and then other good things could be done with that. And Google is a, probably even a better example. They, they created huge amounts of money. But I do think in our mindset, we've got to think about other business models. And we are part of the business model discussion. Right? We, we agree we can help create other business models. And it's not just advertising that makes the money, and then cool things happen. That, that goes back to television and radio in the 30s or 40s. Everything should be free, and then money is created with advertising, and then good things happen. Um, and I'm arguing there is a different path. It's not the only path, but, um, but um, 
um, you know, having actual people, you know, identified as producers and consumers, I think, is a good, healthy thing. So, yeah. Mike, uh, yeah. The, the, at the high level, the description of this seems to be very much like uh, you could describe Uber in this way. Yeah, I, 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 I mentioned that. Yeah, Uber is is sort of like this. It's just they did a bad job. They they were the, one of the first companies that did it. Well, they did a good job for them. Or yeah, they did a kind of well. No, they didn't. They never made money. They're, and then right now, they're, they're, it's not clear whether they're going to survive because now their prices went up and they have a bad pricing net model. They didn't do it. They did a good job for you know themselves, indeed, the, the, and, and for the riders. The riders got the benefit of low prices, but the drivers didn't. They got screwed. And so they, they didn't have a lot of economists on board. They had some good operations research people. But um, it's just a, it's an early experiment. But yeah, Uber, think Uber. Um, I'm, I'm not that far away from that in the, in the space. But I want you to think about the new algorithms that are needed to support something like a good version of this, and not just in the transportation space. Yeah, Nadi. So related to that, so something that's been bothering me with this is yeah. everything in terms of incentives. And yeah. Who are you? And if I'm a, if you go to a restaurant thing, yeah. I want to be go to get a good dinner, right? You want to go have dinner, yeah. No, 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 that's not clear. That's not clear. No, my system is the third, is the intermediate party. Right, but why should I the platform. Trust, why should I trust you as a consumer, right? Why yeah. should I trust your system to be aligned with my incentives? Again, you, you know, you and me are computer science arguing about economics right now, just to be clear what we're doing. And economists would respond to you saying, markets aren't perfect. Sometimes they fail. Sometimes the incentives are not aligned. But we work really, really hard to figure out where the incentives are and what's the overall social welfare. Right? And moreover, our markets are creative. If we create one where it's clear that all the money is going to that person over there and my incentives are not being respected or, or assayed, I leave. I leave the platform. All right? We always have the option of leaving the platform, and we do. Well, but then you're back with Yon. Right? Well, no, Yon made so much money. That's the problem that Facebook's made so much money off of advertising that they're not going to disappear. They'll buy up Instagram. They'll buy up whoever. It becomes something very, very big. And again, good things, you know, a hundred years ago, the, the, the robber barons created you know, vast wealth. It was overall good. Carnegie Mellon was created because of it, right? Overall good. So things get out of whack like that sometimes, right? Um, but most companies are not that. They didn't create immense wealth in some way. They have to kind of live by small margins, right? And so if they create a business model that looks bad, people will walk away. And that happens all the time, right? So you say, okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to respect your incentives. Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to be, you know, I'm, uh, and we're going to talk about more about this, okay? But it's not, these are not silver bullets. They are, they're thinking styles. If you, you need to reveal where the incentives are and see how they're aligned and, and see how people would trust that. Uh, you know, because you can do this badly or you can do it well. Is it a good example? And so I really don't want to get into the details of these particular examples. Most of them, they're kind of bad. They're not done particularly well. Uh, and we could get into philosophical discussions whether Airbnb is good for Rome, you know, to bring all kinds of outside people in, and we could get into the left and the right, could argue about it, and so on. Um, overall, I think this is a healthy era to have things like that. You've got a lot of supply, and you've got a lot of demand, and they're not being matched up at all. All right, and suddenly somebody comes in and makes a matching, and they take some of the flow of the money. When I go to an Airbnb, I don't pay, I pay a little bit to Airbnb, but mostly I pay to the person. And that's good. And you saw this thing in Ukraine where suddenly people are buying up lots of Airbnb and not going there just to give money to people in Ukraine. That's part of the economy, right? That's a nice model of way to have money flow and value flow. People make individual decisions in the context of a market, right? We all know this in our daily experience. We go into markets and, you know, if I go into the, the bazaar in Tel Aviv, it's very wild and crazy, but all of us kind of get something we might want. Or if we go into traffic in India, it's a market. It's trade-offs. We get something we want, and the overall system has some flow to it. And no one designed it. It, it, came, it emerged. Yeah? About the website. Yeah. So do you propose uh, artists and music to companies or to people? Is it like a listening platform? Both. I mean, there's brands. So the NBA was one example. Uh, Nike's another example. So all of these brands, of which there are millions of them out there, want to be associated with cool stuff. Okay, so and so we offer them cool stuff. And they grab an artist who's up and coming and say, that artist, I like their songs. It corresponds to my image. And instead of having to go out and get Brad Pitt or Beyonce or whatever, they get these 16-year-olds. And everybody's happier, really. We have a mechanism for helping find and discover in a, in a market. 
Okay, now that slide I've now had up for a while, but these are things I wrote down actually a few years ago. Uh, here's some of the mathematical problems that we're going to be talking about in the rest of these lectures, my three lectures. Um, so instead of just talking about optima and how do we get down the hill to an optimum, which is most of what we talked about in machine learning, it's more important to go to equilibria because equilibria involve trade-offs. All right, but the same kind of dynamical systems ideas will apply. It's just the gradient descent won't work anymore. We got to use gradients, but use them in different ways. So things like extra gradient will work. How many people in the room know what extra gradient is? Just to see. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Big idea here to learn about it. You need to learn about it because if you know what gradient is, you know what extra gradient is. You know, it's it's really at least half the picture. It's a much better algorithm for these kind of purposes. So we'll talk about that using dynamical systems tools and stochastic processes and even continuous time stuff. And so the physicists of the mind in the room will have much to chew on. Um, and we, as we've already talked about, are interested in now multi-way markets in which agents have to explore to learn their preferences. That explore word means explore, exploit. It means bandits. So we're going to bring bandits into the picture here. Because when I go into a market, I don't know my preferences are priori. I've got to try some things and sort of see what rewards I'm getting. And that'll help me shape my preferences. And that'll go into the further matching. Okay? It's not just a bandit thing all by itself plugged into it. It's an integrated bandit matching. I've already talked about this in the context like the restaurant example. We will talk about uncertainty quantification. If you don't do that well, none of this will work. Um, it's not enough just to make predictions and then have kind of ad hoc uncertainty. Uh, here, the uncertainty has really got to be calibrated. Otherwise, the whole system will start to unravel. Um, mechanism design we'll be talking about. I'm also going to talk about contracts. How many of you know what contract theory is? Okay, nobody will go learn about contract theory. How many of you know what auction theory is? Optimal auction theory. Okay, you all know what auctions are a little bit, and maybe you learned in econ class about optimal auctions. Nobel Prize was given for that. Uh, I think that's less relevant, but contract theory is very, very relevant. This is where there's a principal and some agents. The principal knows less than the agents, but wants to get the agents to do things. And there's going to be data going back and forth and all that. So a lot of these machine learning problems have that character, and we need to reveal that and make clear that we know what we're doing. Incentive aware things, and then all these kind of trade-offs, uh, I'm arguing, are not just about um, uh, differential privacy or whatever, it's about you know, trade-offs. All right, so here's the overall goal, is to create healthy, fair, learning-based markets that are stabilized over long stretches of time. And I, I don't know any other way to think about stabilizing over long stretches of time. I don't think our current machine learning stuff does that. And we have all these problems of distribution shift and all that, we're not stabilized. And we don't really have an overall kind of equilibrium sort of model for our machine learning systems. We've got to start talking about that. All right, so um, this is what I've been doing in my own group for the last 10 years, and this is what I'm going to start my lectures with, is that, so if we go to the economists and we say, hey, we want to join you guys, we, we have you know, this machine learning stuff to, to, to bring to the, to, the, to the picture, and they say, oh, does that mean, um, you know, back propagation? And we say, yeah, we got gradient-based methods, but not only. We got some other mathematical progress that you're going to, uh, you know, be able to use. And so we're going to talk a little bit about, in fact, some gradient-based optimization. I mean, I've got Nadi and Francis and Leon in the room who are real experts. They can help me. But, but here, this really brings in some of the physics. Uh, there's a lot of insight to be gotten to go by going into continuous time, which is something that computer scientists and operations, or, you know, optimization people often don't do. But if you go into continuous time, you get a lot of insight, and then you integrate with symplectic integrators to get back. How many of you know what symplectic integrators are? I just want to kind of have a feel of my audience. Okay. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the sampling versions of these things with um, kind of work on long-term diffusion. I won't want to spend that much time there. Um, but again, I want to put some decision-making kind of things into my diffusions. <laughs> then we're definitely going to talk about uncertainty quantification. These conformal prediction ideas are brand new. They're exciting. They're scalable. And they allow us to... Uh, um, do things we couldn't do before. And then I want to spend some time on the mathematics of variational inequalities and equilibria. So these are gradient-based algorithms that, so for example, let's suppose I have a dynamical system whose vector field looks something like this. There's circles. So the vectors are all going like this. Okay, so they're literally tangent to the circles. So it's, it's, got vort it's a vortex, right? Um, what will a gradient-based algorithm do here? First of all, is this an interesting learning problem? Well, it doesn't seem to have an optimum. It doesn't. Um, why would we ever want to solve that kind of problem? Solve. What does this even solve mean here? Point. Yeah, fixed point. Exactly. We're going to move away from just finding flow that looks like this to flow that might look like that. 
And in this case, there is a fixed point. It sits right there. If you start there, you stay there. Now, if you don't start there, in a naive algorithm, just like good old you know, gradient type algorithms, a couple things might happen. First of all, you might cycle, all right? But you'd only cycle in continuous time. In discrete time, what'll happen is I'll start there, I'll go out a finite amount, and now I'm on a, outer, a further circle. I'm gonna spiral out with any gradient-based algorithm, all right? So gradient descent will fail here completely. And you don't wanna fail, because what you really want is something that does this. All right, now, so what class of problems have this kind of flow? Yeah, this is a min-max problem. This is two agent zero-sum game. All right, this is a Nash equilibrium, and you'd like to arrive at that Nash equilibrium. Every, both, both sides would be happy. Out here, no one's happy. Well, only one side is happy, the other side's not. So this is kind of like best response gives you this flow, and you'd like the best responses to go back and forth and to settle into something nice, a fixed point. All right. All right, so the, the mathematics of that is called variational inequalities. Again, it has a physics-y kind of flavor. These are inequalities that are described in a variational way. And we'll talk about algorithms. Here are the main two classes of algorithms that um, we can talk about, and we will do some of that. And then there's lots of open problems with stochastic versions of this. Here, the stochastic stuff with Francis and others has been done very beautifully. Here, there's work, but much less, and there's a lot of opportunities here. So my contribution to this are not Huge, but they all can be found right there, and I'm gonna talk about all of these. All right, so um, here's the outline of the rest of my two days, or three days, or whatever. I'm gonna start with on the whiteboard, because Lenka says you gotta do some work on the, on, the, uh, on the blackboard, so I will. Uh, that'll be some background, and I'll write some equations out and do some derivations, just to show you I can do it. Uh, and then I'm gonna get into what I consider the core. This is all brand new research. These are all brand new problems to work on. And so, you know, God bless everybody working on neural nets. I love it, it's wonderful, it's a great era for this. Those aren't the only problems in town. And especially those with you with a physics background, I really wanna get some of you off and working on these kind of problems. So uh, by the end of the three days, I wanna, I wanna get to the mathematics um, for all these, these problems. And you'll probably think of some new connections that no one else ever thought of. Before getting diving into this, what I wanna do is to, like, pick one or maybe two of these and briefly give you a flavor of it, just so you can see where we're gonna end up going, okay? So let me start with strategic classification. So you all know what classification is. It's you know, a prediction problem. Um, but let's talk about what it means when you have strategy, strategic agents that are in a prediction problem. So let's work with Tiana and Eric, uh, grad students with me at Berkeley. Eric's now professor at Caltech. Um, all right, so this I think all of you know uh, that when you deploy decision-making algorithms or learning algorithms in the real world, you often have strategic behavior. So um, suppose that I'm filling out a health insurance form because I want to get health insurance, all right? And so the health insurance company asked me to fill out some kind of a form about my health, and then they're going to evaluate that and give me a, a price relative to how healthy I look. Now, I know that, so I'm going to try to lie. I'm going to not lie. I'm going to shade things a little bit. I'm going to appear a little more healthy than I actually am, all right? And so I'm going to supply data, which is biased. Right? They're going to take in that data, they're going to build a classifier, but it's got some bias in it. Is that bad or good? Well, it's just life. All right? And in particular, health insurance companies are aware of this, and they will make it hard for me to lie. All right? They will make it, so you, you know, so they will say, how much do you exercise? The dumb thing would be just ask me and I write down number, the number of hours per week. I'm going to lie, obviously. But then they can say, well, I'm going to get harder for you. What I want to do is have access to your cell phone and, uh, for a day, and I'll upload the accelerometer readings, and I will get an idea about how much movement you're doing today. Are you sitting there, or are you moving around a lot? And that's a little harder for me to lie about, but not that hard. So someone in Italy built a device where you set your cell phone there, and it moves it around all day long. <laughs> all right, so you have to pay a little money, though, to, to lie in this way. All right, but, but what's going to happen there here is there's a game. This is a game, all right, between the central decision maker and the, and the agents. Now, this is well known in economics. This is called Goodhart's Law, which is that if there's some score of some kind, some measure that people care about, like for example, the poverty index score was defined in 1994. It looked very nice and Gaussian. The population was all spread out in a beautiful way. By 2003, it looked like that because people started to figure out they could game the system. They could lie a little bit and seem to be more poor than they really were, and they would get more benefits. And this happens with every measure in economics. So how do you fix this? Well, you, first of all, you've got to just realize you've got a game here. Okay, so this is not just collect data, analyze it, and then worry, oh, there's some bias, I better de-bias it in some ad hoc way. This is, there's an actual game. So 
the strategic agents want a favorable prediction. So they supply some strategic data. Central decision maker builds a logistic regression or something with that strategic data and then broadcasts a predictive model. All right, now there's many examples of this. Will you broadcast the entire model? Maybe, maybe for regulatory reasons you have to, or maybe for business reasons you have to say, here's what I'm doing, I'm the bank, and here's how I evaluate loans, because otherwise I, people won't come to your bank. Um, but in any case, they build a model, and then the agents look at that model, and then they think about how can I further gain that model. So they provide some new data that they think is gonna move them close to some decision boundary. And this goes back and forth for, for years. All right, so this in economics would be called a Stackelberg game. Stackelberg just means the sequential game. So Nash games or Nash equilibria where we have two or more decision makers, they make simultaneous decisions. Rock, paper, scissors, all right, or uh, prisoner's dilemma. Simultaneous decisions and you reveal a reward. And that's it. Stackelberg games is there's a leader who makes the first decision and then there's a follower who makes the second decision given what the first person made. And these have different equilibria, they are not Nash equilibria, and most economists I know think this is a much more interesting kind of equilibrium than Nash. Nash is kind of this artificial situation where we make these simultaneous decisions, and that's sort of hard to arrange in real life, and, and often it's not predictive of human behavior, whereas Stackelberg is better. Um, all right, so this is a Stackelberg game, and in Stackelberg games you've got to think about who's the leader and who's the follower. Is it better to be the leader or the follower? Uh, well, now you have to do some game theory, and you have to say, what's it mean to be better and all that? And the short answer is, it depends. So some Stockelberg games, it's better to be the leader. You're, you're sort of setting down, you, you get to decide, and then the other person's got to decide in the context of what you decided, so you kind of determined the, the dynamics. Uh, in, in other games, it's better to be the follower, because they did something, um, um, but then you get to do the best thing after that, and they just have to kind of be very protective, okay? Uh, so it depends. Um, but anyway, that's part of the mathematics of analyzing Stackelberg games. Now, um, th this topic, st uh, strategic classification, does have a bit of a small literature where people have analyzed this as a Stackelberg game. We were not the first to do this. Um, but it's been a limited analysis from a dynamical point of view. You assume that it's all synchronized. So this is a repeated game in which, at a given moment, you gather data and you build the model. And then you do that again. And it's all synchronized. Um, so BR in a lot of these lectures will mean best response, okay? So it's this, given what the situation, here's the best I'm, thing I can do. So here's my best data. All right, um, so uh, you can analyze this. It does have an equilibria. And um, what's it, what it turns out is that the social welfare of this equilibrium is bad for the strategic agents and good for the central decision maker. They have high social welfare. These people don't. They have much lower than you would hope, All right? So if you're Google up here, you feel this is pretty good, but you know, maybe if you're down here, you don't feel it so good. All right, so we decided that we would start to analyze this in a richer dynamical systems framework where these are not synchronized anymore, that the different agents can go at different time scales and determine their own time scale. All right, so this feels much more like the real world. Why should I be synchronized to Google's updates or whatever? Um, all right, so here in this case, uh, the central agent is going slowly for some reason, and, and the uh, the other agents are going quickly. Um, but we can go the other direction as well. And so we, we talk about two kinds of markets here, proactive and reactive. So the proactive case is this one where the central decision maker is going slowly and the agents are doing it quickly. And then we'll talk about the other one. Now does this one, this seems less, you know, why would the central agent ever go slowly? They got all the computing power in the world. Well, this happens all the time. All right, so um, college admissions has a model of who gets admitted and who doesn't. Uh, increasingly, it's based on machine learning ideas. Um, and they're not going to uh, update the model after every applicant. Okay, no, they publish a kind of policy for a couple of years and keep it constant, okay, for many reasons. All right, similarly with uh, credit scoring. All right, so this is an actual real world uh, use case. Uh, but the other direction is uh, also a real world use case where the central agent has all the computing power and they update the model as fast as they want to. So, like YouTube. Every, every, you know, every browser, browsing experience is data and um, they update their model very, very quickly. All right. Um, so um, now you can start doing the mathematics that we'll be talking about later involving variational inequalities, analyzing these two situations. And let me just tell you some results. So first of all, there's a theorem which is not that big of a deal, but it is that we do get Stackelberg equilibrium, equilibria with either order of play. There's a topology of these equilibria. And they're different. 
So with the follower leader reversed, you get a different equilibrium. Okay, so that's of some interest, but here's the surprising result, which is that in these standard statistical settings, so the, where the game is a, what we call a statistical Stackelberg game, where the one best response is to build a generalized linear model, say a logistic regression. That's the central decision maker's response in the game. Collect some data and then build a statistical model, and then you ship that back to the other side. All right, so um, let's call that a statistical Stackelberg game. So in this setting, it turns out that the, the um, strategic agents are happier than they were before. Okay, they're getting optimal social welfare. All right, so that's not too surprising because they're the ones who are now, um, uh, they're the ones who are updating more quickly. Um, but surprisingly, the central decision maker is also happier. Okay, so this is a win-win, and this is not that common in game theory. Um, okay, so it turns out the, the better ordering is where the Central decision maker goes slowly, and the strategic agents go quickly in this statistical model setting. So this is a new theorem in game theory, if you will, uh, and it's not for arbitrary Stackelberg games because we know that we have both orderings give you different social welfare in general games. But for the class of games that are statistical based on um, generalized linear models, uh, it turns out that the equilibrium is always favorable to have the, the strategic, strategic agents going more quickly. All right, so there's a nice theorem there. Um, it has a statistical flavor and it has a microeconomic flavor. You, you can't do them separately. It's really, uh, the two ideas are coming together. Um, let me give you a little other teaser for what we're gonna get to in these lectures. This is about uncertainty quantification for very large systems. Um, so uh, let's work with colleagues Anastasios and Steven at Berkeley and then colleagues Emmanuel and Lee Wai at Stanford. Um, um, and so what we're, Building on here is this, um, we're trying to build kind of notions of uncertainty that are not just kind of classical simple error bars. All right, so in particular we have in mind that you have some big complex state-of-the-art model, which certainly could be a big neural net, or it could be a big Bayesian system of some kind, but it has dubious uncertainty quantification, right? Meaning it's gonna make a prediction and it's gonna put a little error bar around that, but it's kind of dubious, it's just sort of ad hoc. It's, it's a little fudge factor. And when I mean something that's not dubious, that means I have statistical coverage. So I give like, you know, real confidence interval like in statistics that I can guarantee the truth is within my interval with a predetermined probability, like 90%. All right? Um, so now, um, and, and why would a Bayesian model be dubious? Well, you have to put in a big prior, and in these big complex systems, who knows what prior to put in, so they put in an arbitrary prior or something, and so the output is dubious. Okay? Um, all right, so one way to think about fixing this is you kind of go in and you do a lot of mathematics on this and you try to figure out what are the fluctuations, the second order terms, and some expansion of the free energy, and you could do all that. Very complex, probably not going to work. It's going to be very asymptotic. Another thing you could do is start calculating kind of second partial derivatives and, and make Gaussian assumptions and so on. Or you could try to do the bootstrap, where you take the original training data and you resample it with replacement, do it many, many times, and that will give you a bootstrap error. That will give you statistical coverage. It's just very highly computational intensive. So those are kind of the current options, and there may be some others. Another idea that might, if this is possibly really great, is that you take the output of this and you never touch the black box. You never go inside of it, you never calculate any more partial derivatives, but you somehow use some data and form a calibration layer which changes the outputs in some way, um, and it's gonna involve quantiles, that gives you something that does actually have statistical coverage properties, okay? And the fact that this is possible is, is kind of a little surprising. It was sort of missed uh, in the stat literature for a long time, and there's this fellow, Vladimir Folkt, who was, a, who was in, in England, a student of Kolmogorov, who had this idea, and then a few other people like Larry Wasserman picked up on it, Jing Lei, and it's become a thing. It's called conformal methods, and I'll be telling you about that. Let me just sort of say, here's a little picture to give you a flavor of the math we'll talk about. Um, here's a bunch of tumors, and you're trying to find the, where's the tumor and what's, what's not tumor. And it's very, very hard to calibrate here the uncertainty of all these pixels in the image, all right? And so it's quite easy to start to, you know, uh, have too many false negatives to kind of, you know, put your threshold in the wrong place. Uh, this is not just a, a pixel-wise threshold. This is a false discovery rate threshold, okay? We want the fraction of overall pixels to be good. That's, false, that's a ratio of things, and it's harder than just classical standard uh, classification errors. So you set it in one particular case, you get lots of false negatives here. I've missed the tumor. Or you said in the other way, you get lots of false positives, where I think everything's a tumor. All right, and there is a Goldilocks zone, and finding that is the whole game. You know, as a statistician, 
that's really hard to do and you need to try to find it. So long story short, this technology allows you to convert this problem to a one-dimensional functional. That's kind of the surprise that that's possible. And now you have a nested set of predictors um, and, there's a, and they're indexed by a quantity lambda. And then there's a theorem, that's a concentration theorem, that says I can tell you how to pick this lambda, and this is sort of a martingale argument, um, where I can control the, um, the coverage. Okay, so I pick lambda in a particular way under a particular theorem, and now from data I can pick a lambda which tells me what zone in which to threshold things to, to get the overall control of the errors. All right, so here's an example of doing this on alpha fold, which is the, uh, the deep mind's Prediction of protein structure, very successful. I really like it. Um, it takes in strings of amino acids and it predicts a protein. Um, but they didn't do any uncertainty quantification. They just predicted a protein. Or, but they had a, or they had some dubious uncertainty quantification. Well, we can use that as a black box and put this calibration layer on that and now annotate the entire alpha fold output with confidence intervals. Right? And so we did that. And the confidence intervals here are not just classical confidence intervals from some number to some other number. These are set valued. Okay, so I'm going to give an output of a set of proteins. I can guarantee you that the true protein is in there with probably 90%. Okay? And I can do that for every protein. Now, I'm going to show you in the next picture doing this in a domain you're probably more familiar with. This is going to be computer vision, where we're taking a state-of-the-art, um, you know, in this particular case, Berkeley-style state-of-the-art computer vision system that's looking at a visual scene and annotating the visual scene with what object is where. Okay? So that's become you know, very much a commodity, very big success story of deep learning. Um, and we're going to add this calibration layer to that box, which we add as a black box, and we're going to add a calibration layer. And so for every object in the scene, there'll be a set-valued predictor. So if it's not sure, it might say car, truck, and bicycle, and I can guarantee that it's one of those three with probability 90%. I get coverage, statistical coverage. Okay? And we'll do that everywhere in the scene. So you'll see the scene, and you'll see some places where there's a point predictor. It means it's quite sure with 90%. Other places, there's a bigger set value predictor, and just the size of the set already tells you how much uncertainty there is. All right, but moreover, we get, we're getting actual statistical coverage. So let me just show you the picture here, and I'll answer your question or discuss with you afterwards. All right, so you know you can see here they're not so sure. It's car truck, you know, whatever car truck, car truck, uh, and time. This evolves over time. Um, uh, here's a different technology we used that where we had, you don't even need monotone risks, you, you can have non-monotone, and you can see there's, you know, again, very sure of a giraffe, but it might be a zebra from time to time. Um, and here's another example with lots of occlusion. So you have a backpack or a handbag, not entirely sure, but it's one of the two. All right, so again, this is being done with, the computational effort here is almost none. I'm going to tell you about the actual mathematics. But this is just take the neural net and, and don't do any retraining of it and don't do any particular other, you know, heavyweight calculations. Okay? Please. I'm just wondering, I don't know if you're discussing this later for the proteins. How do you, what's the hierarchy of sets views or how do you describe the... Uh, I'll be describing it later. But I wanted, this is a teaser, so you, you seem, so you're suitably, suitably teased. <laughs> All right. All right, so, um, Lenka, you want to tell me what my time situation is? Am I halfway through? Or a little more? I have half an hour, okay. Uh, do you want me to take a couple minute stretching break or not? Oh, you don't. Wow, you're, uh, you, you're younger than me. <laughs> all right. Um, okay, any questions from the, this is all the setup of my talks. I, I, I meant to be a bit provocative, um, but I really do believe a lot of what I'm saying about our field is a big engineering field, and it's not just about prediction, it's about all these other things. I hope you gave you a hint of what I think some of the important other things are. And now I'm gonna try to challenge you with the mathematics. Any questions or comments? And not just the old people giving comments. You're not old. You can comment. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not based on two players. Uh, there's, the extra grading applies to n players. Uh, but you're asking a really great question about scalability. I mean, a lot of economics has its own kind of scalability. It works pretty well in some dimensions. In other dimensions, it doesn't work very well. You run into intractabilities quickly. And you now have uh, mathematical challenges that are sometimes surmounted in interesting ways. So for example, just to take uh, game theory, there's a whole field called mean field games. And you might, if you're a physicist, might imagine what that is. And it's exactly what you might imagine. And there now, you can define a mean field approximation to a game, 
and you can define when it's a good approximation, and now you can define algorithms which solve the mean field game. And you can relax those things, and blah, 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 okay? Um, so there's, there's, there's obvious, with any kind of advanced field, obviously they immediately gotcha, how could you possibly do that? And our job is to say, well, you can kind of do that. Any other, yeah? So back to the music example. Yeah. Um, wouldn't uh, introducing something big like that centralized, essentially a centralized record label, wouldn't that disrupt the natural, natural ecosystem of record labels that already exist? No. Okay, so the, there is an ecosystem. I wouldn't call it a natural one. I'd call it a very unnatural one. It was a few people in Hollywood that got uber rich, um, and um, they made all the money, and they gave it to their friends. And, that, and every, you can talk to any musician for like now 30 years. They hate the system. It's, it's broken. Okay? So it's, it's an ecosystem that's, that's really for, it's, it's a you know, monopoly, and it, it's, it's a bad monopoly. Okay? And so it, and it's blocked change for a long time. And so people, many, many good-hearted people went in to try to, you know, adjust the record company industry's model and change things and argue with them and all that, and it's all failed, all right? And you might think about the taxi industry and Uber. That's uh, maybe another example. It's, uh, I, I'm less enamored of that one, but still, I think this one's a very clear example where the monopoly erodes, it'd be created an ecosystem. You want to disrupt that. It's a terrible ecosystem for social welfare reasons. We can calculate the social welfare loss, and it's huge. Literally, 18-year-olds in the, in the inner city are making great music that people around the world are listening to, and they're not getting any income. That's just broken. And they can go knock on the door in Hollywood and try to get it, and they're not going to make it. Okay, so, yeah. Maybe just a general question. I mean, you yeah. told us about this, this vision. How, does, how do we accomplish it? I mean, is it the second part where you will show us the math? Is the math Yeah, the math, some, oh, yeah. Yeah. Is it yeah. yeah. So let's, let's discuss that after two days, um, first of all. But um, um, here's my current thinking, which is that, uh, first of all, a lot of us are missing, missing some of the relevant math here. If you don't know how to find fixed points, you're missing some very relevant math. Um, and if you don't know how to do this in stochastic settings with sampling and all that, you're also missing. So there's all kinds of math that you're going to need to learn. You need to learn contract theory, because that's like this asymmetry of information. You need to learn how to handle that, and so on and so forth. Um, but I can guarantee you that as soon as you learn all the math, relevant math, and I, I haven't, but I've learned uh, some approximation, I'm now older, uh, you just still don't know how to solve some of the key problems. And you don't even know how to form, I'd like to formulate brand new problems of the kind like the Kolmogorov or Shannon formulated. And we don't think we have those problems quite yet, the kind of the bohr atom problem, all right? But we're going to get them soon. I think it feels uh, really soon. Um, and at that moment, I think new math will arise. Okay. Now, will it be not familiar to von Neumann or to Gauss? No, they'll probably have thought about it, but um, I think it'll still it'll be relatively new because these are really, really hard challenges, non-trivial. And I think for the young people in the room, I really think this is a diff this is a really like this is like in the 30s where the, all the new ideas of uncertainty and control and you know um, dynamics came together and, and computer science, theoretical computer science. But all those fields kind of got separated off. The theoretical computer scientists work on a class of problems. The control theorists work on another. The statisticians are another. Econists. And they hardly talk to each other at all. And eventually, some language kind of percolates across. But really, the real problem sitting there needing all of those perspectives to come together. And some new math will be needed for that. All right. The other point of view I have here is that um, what's happening in this era is not just that we have these great mathematical tools and we're trying to find applications for them. What's happening is, is much like the development of, say, uh, chemical engineering in the 30s and 40s. All right. So before the 30s, there was, no, there was no such thing called chemical engineering. But what was there? Well, there was chemistry for sure, and there was quantum mechanics already. So you knew what happened when you put molecules together. You could make very good predictions, right? And in a test tube, you could, it would kind of work out. But then someone said, well, what if we build a factory out in a field and the flow, the huge flows of, of stuff, could we make it such that you know chlorine comes out or plastics come out? And, um, and so given what we know right now, well, no, it's kind of hard, but let's try anyway. And so people built factories, and they exploded, or sometimes they didn't work. Mostly they just didn't work. Um, but sometimes it started to work, all right? And so this became just engineering in some sense. But as you know, then chemical engineering emerged. And it took about 20 years for a new field to emerge. It had new thermodynamics ideas, new mathematics, and that's called chemical engineering. When you study chemical engineering, you're not just doing the engineering of chemistry. It's its own field. Same thing with electrical engineering. Around 1900, there was no electrical engineering, but there were Maxwell's equations already. So we had a full understanding of the entire um, phenomenon. But to actually put electricity into a home and make sure the home doesn't burn down, or to build circuits, or to t take power across a country, no idea. 
All right? So people had to think of new mathematics. So now when you study electrical engineering, you do a lot of math. All right? It's, you know? Um, so I think what's happening right now is that we have these proto-disciplines that are basically computer science and statistics, and I'm adding economics to the list. Those, to me, are the three proto-disciplines that gave us inference, you know, computation, and incentives. Right? And we have enough now that we can build factories, meaning a system like you know, transportation system or an e-commerce system or a finance system. So we do. We build these factories, and sometimes they kind of work. Some people make a lot of money. Some good things happen. And then a lot of times they really break because we don't know the externalities. Don't, we don't know the incentives. We don't know what bad problems are arising. And we've done a lot of that, too. All right? So um, I think it'll take about 20 years. And this new field that's emerging, it's, it's, it's engineering. It's, it's, that's what machine learning really is to me. Okay, it's not new mathematics, per se. I know a lot of machine learning, and I can tell you every idea I know about was already in statistics by probably the 50s or certainly by the 60s. It's been deepened, but every single idea was already there. So it's not new, but it's an engineering mindset. Let's do this at scale. All right? Let's not just do this on our little kind of 20-parameter you know, model. Um, so I don't know, so I hope maybe that helps a little bit. Uh, you know, a lot of people, by the way, don't like the word engineering. You know, if you say... Engineering sounds bad, right? Like social science, that sounds wonderful. Social engineering, that sounds terrible. You know, genome science sounds great. Genome engineering, uh, right? Even like mathematical science, that sounds brilliant. Mathematical engineering, right? But the oddity is that engineering has changed our lives more than just about anything else. You know, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, electrical engineering. Think what, 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 you know, science has supported all that, but, you know, those are the big, big events. And back in the 40s and 50s, a lot of young people of your age were doing chemical engineering. That was the most exciting thing possible. Now it's computer science, all right? But these are the big efforts of the era. So I think it is an engineering overall. Let's build things. And that's what distinguishes it from the previous generation of statisticians and even theoretical computer science, which were a little bit more about let's analyze things. Any other? Those are great questions. Thank you. Someone else had a hand up here? Okay, so let's go, let's do a little bit of, uh, get into some details. Uh, oh yeah, there's my little picture. I think I'll, um, actually let me take a moment to do this, okay? So um, I, do, I do believe these are three foundational disciplines of a new engineering field. And of course there's control theory, statistical mechanics all around supporting, but these are really core ways of thinking. Incentives, computation, in, uh, inference. Um, and there are pairwise connections between all these things. So you may or may not know about algorithmic game theory. It's a blend of economics and computer science. Um, emerged maybe 20 years ago, people like Tim Roughgarden. Um, I think of machine learning as really just a blend of statistical ideas, inferential thinking together with computational thinking. Um, and I think of, and then of course statistics with economics, that's called econometrics. All three of these uh, pairwise things kind of miss the third dimension. So algorithmic game theory has very little data and statistics. It's all about just the algorithms like auctions. Right? Econometrics is kind of more about measuring the economy, measuring the macroeconomy in particular. And it's not very much about building algorithms that actually work on problems. And then I think machine learning, very nice blend of these two things, has had very little economics. Now that's, of course, all of these are caricatures. They're definitely people. If you go to the EC conference, you'll find some machine learning people who also do economics. They, they, it exists. Um, but really what we need is people that are plopped right down in the middle that have all these expertises. Why do we need that? Not just from an academic point of view, from a real-world problem-solving point of view. Because those were the real, the real world problems often in, involve incentives, computation and scale, and inference and uncertainty in data. Um, and moreover, if you go back to the foundations of all three of those fields, like in the 30s and 40s, people like Blackwell, von Neumann, Arrowwald, et cetera, those people were not one of the above. They were all. Okay, so Blackwell is one of my favorite uh, people from that era. He was certainly a statistician. I knew him. He, that's where his heart was. But he did a lot of important work in economics, and he did a lot of important work in computer science. And a lot of these ideas are continuing to be rediscovered. You know, Blackwell approachability, that's what's behind online learning, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, von Neumann, obviously, you know, you know Arrow was an was a economist, but he also did a lot of work in computer science and statistics, and Wald was really both a statistician and computer, and, and econo economics person as well. Um, okay, so I'm kind of arguing that we're, we're really in an era where you guys are going to be more like these people, and less like the people that got into one particular discipline. Right. Yeah. I'm curious where you put the engineering uh, access on that... Uh, where I put engineering? Well, yeah. Yeah, that figure was really kind of an academics figure about the disciplines, or an academic history and all that, right? But I, just like I was uh, using the metaphor of chemical engineering, 
the foundational disciplines were quantum mechanics, fluid mechanics, maybe you know, statistical mechanics. Right? That led to then chemical engineering emerging from those foundations, those pillars. I see these three axes as the pillars of this new emerging field, which is being called AI. I hate that terminology. This is not AI. It's not thought in the computer, you know, solving the world's problems. But it's being called AI. But I think the right way to think about it is there's these pillars in the ground, and we're building this engineering discipline on top of that with new mathematics, and we're currently calling it AI. And if you have a better name, I would love it, and we, we should all you know, wave the banner. Um, but, um, or maybe someone else will have a better name. But anyway, that's, yeah, that's the perspective. And of course, when you write down three of them, people say, well, what about X, Y, Z? I, you know, I think of control theory and social mechanics that applied math as supporting all of this. But these are three ways of thinking that are critical. OK, so let me um, start to do, start moving towards more of the mathematical treatment. So I'm going to kind of be um, elementary here for a while, given some, you know, I think some of this will be very, very familiar to you. So I want to start with just kind of a little bit of optimization theory, talk a little bit about um, smoothness ideas and, you know, and algorithms based on that. Um, so I can move as quickly as possible into uh, extra gradient, on proximal point methods, so we can talk about uh, fixed point algorithms. Um, and let's see. All right, so I'll see how far I can get today. Um, I will, by the way, at some point, kind of right, have a little uh, things, thing, cool books to read. Um, and my favorite book on convex analysis that kind of extends to operator theory and so on is Boschke and Combet. Um, if you want to read that before tomorrow, that would be wonderful. Um, and then Fakine and um, I think, is it Pang or Ping? I think it's Pang. Um, that's my favorite kind of follow-on book from this, which is about variational inequalities. And so if you haven't learned about variational inequalities, that's a fantastic place to learn about them. Um, uh, and, um, and of course, maybe behind all of this is Rockefeller. If you haven't kind of read basic convex analysis kind of things, start with Rockefeller. But probably you can move right to this. And then here's, I think, where a lot of you would like to be. Um, so let's kind of try to get you as close to, you know, what variational inequalities in, are as possible. Um, okay, so let's kind of start with convex, you know, functions and kind of Nesterov-style presentation of um, subgradient algorithms and so, so on and so forth. And so I hope uh, Francis and Nati are particular experts, but some of the rest of you are as well. Jump in if you want to add something. All right, so let's just, I'm going to kind of go quickly and just if I get, if you get really lost, just raise your hand and, I'll, and we'll, we'll stop. So, um, so let's just look at the setting, you know, f is convex. F is also defined on some domain. Let me not get into that. There's going to be a convex domain, and it'll be closed. F will be a proper function, blah, blah, blah. There's always kind of regularity things, which I don't want to get into. Let's just kind of go with it. You guys are physicists. You don't care about all of the actual mathematics, do you? Um, all right, and the idea of a subgradient, so G uh, at some point X is a subgradient. It just means it's a lower bounding. It, it defines a lower bounding li a line uh, at X if... Um, we have a lower bounding line for the function f. And inner product for me is going to be denoted in the optimization theory uh, style like that. Okay, so if here's our function f. Uh, here's a subgradient. The subgradient is the slope of that line. All right, now um, obviously a subgradient here is a function of x, so it's a function. All right, but in general, subgradients are not unique. And so here's a, a, you know, you really want to have the absolute value function, you know, f of x is equal to absolute value of x in mind for a lot of these problems. Uh, so here, it's, it's um, we have this corner. Uh, and so in fact, there's now many slopes here. Um, here, all of these slopes are, are good, good. And so the, um, the, the sub-deferential is the collection, um, you know, um, all g of x, um, it's a set of all uh, g of x at a given x. All right, so now we have a set-valued function. For any x, I might have a whole set. Um, and um, we'll be talking about properties of that set as you move around in the x space, for example, being monotone and, or strongly monotone and things like that. All right, so here, I guess, for this particular problem, the subgradient, the subdifferential, which is denoted like this, So the subdifferential of that particular function would be what? Um, one if x is greater than zero, be minus one if x is negative, 
and these are sets actually usually you wouldn't put the sets and then here it's an interval okay of course if f is also differentiable which it's not here but it is here so f differentiable okay implies that the subgradient um, is unique and the subdifferential therefore is just the gradient it's a point so you wouldn't typically put the brackets okay and so now we can talk about subgradient method for uh, trying to optimize a convex function so subgradient method it's not a descent method so we wouldn't say subgradient descent it can go make a step uh, and go uphill All right, is that a raise hand no okay All right. if you try to correct me already I'm in trouble <laughs> Um, all right, so you, you all know what this method is. You know, you choose x1 in some way. Um, let's, let's make it such that it's, you know, inside of some, um, you know, co compact domain. So x star will denote an optimum. Uh, maybe it's unique, maybe it's not. Let's assume it's unique here. And let's make sure that we start within some ball r. And then the iterate. The relation is just that x at time t plus 1 is equal to x of t minus some subgradient. And if it's not unique, you know, pick one. You have, you have to have some way of picking a specific one. Uh, there'll be a step size. And then g sub t is equal to the subgradient using that notation at, um, at point x t. Uh, and so g t is in the subdifferential of f at x t. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and do a little analysis of that already so we get our kind of start to understand the tools that you use to analyze these kind of things. All right. Um, so um, these are just numerical algorithms. Um, if you're a kind of continuous time warrior in person, you're going to write down an ODE at this point. Here we'll go write down a discrete time thing. Uh, later, we will turn these into ODEs and high resolution ODEs, in fact. But for now, let's just do a discrete time kind of story. So let's try to bound an error. Um, and let's do use squared norms. I'm going to use Euclidean norm. Um, if you don't like Euclidean norm, you can put in other norms. That's usually called mirror descent. Um, but let's use Euclidean norms. Uh, we want the square there because we want Pythagorean kind of calculations. Squares of things behave nicely. Uh, with non-squares, it's harder. All right, so you all know what to do here. You put in the dynamics. So the dynamics is given by that thing over there. So you'll plug that in. I'll get xt minus eta subgradient. And we want to analyze how far we, we are after we made a step of some kind. All right, and now you all know what to do because of the square. We can expand it out, and we will get a um, an inner product, and then we will get another quadratic term here. Okay, so this is high school mathematics, but really pretty important. So let me just pause and absorb a little bit here. Uh, now, as an analyst, we want to analyze these terms. All right, and we want to get control of them, over them somehow simultaneously. All right, and so there's going to be lots of analyses and lots of problems and lots of assumptions, and they all involve different kind of ways of manipulating and bringing together these various terms. Okay, so sometimes, so first of all, we have this here and this here. If I subtract this over here, it looks like I get a telescoping sum. All right, so that's in fact what we're almost always going to aim for is getting a telescoping sum, so fundamental theorem of calculus, basically. Okay. Also, there's kind of cool work where you don't get quite a telescoping sum, but if you take Poisson numbers of things, you get, on average, a telescoping sum, and so on. There's kind of interesting mathematics. So anyway, that term kind of usually goes with this, but not always. Uh, this looks kind of, you know, in some cases, fairly easy. Um, here, we're going to just kind of assume this away by putting an upper bound on our subgradients, which is not uncommon. Um, and then this will be the complicated term, quote unquote. It's not that complicated here. Um, but this is not uncommon in, in physics, right? You know, the, the inner products are the hard things to work with, or, or the things that you make the most progress on, okay? Uh, if you can control this. So often we'll turn this into something that combines with this, and already kind of like Cauchy-Schwartz would give us a norm of G, 
and somehow combine with that, but that would be a product, so we'd still have to work a little harder. Okay, but anyway, the game is basically you get AB, and one of these two things converges with the other. They create a single term, which behaves well when you sum it, and then the telescoping sum handles the rest, and that's kind of the analysis. Okay, so let's just do that for this particular case where we're making kind of some strong assumptions. Um, okay, so let's see. Always it's less than or equal to. If you're in doubt, put down a less than or equal to and hope that you get something to work out. Um, all right, so if I were doing this in, in a classroom back in Berkeley, I'd sort of make you think about it for a little bit. But um, let's just see real quick. Does anyone have a, what, what simple control we could get over that based on the kind of the tools we know so far? Okay, so first of all, we want an upper bound. That negative there means this should be kind of lower bounded. Yeah, use that convexity thing. That I probably have erased it by now, but the sub, what's called the subgraded inequality, f of y is greater than or equal to f of x plus the linear term. Okay, it works out in the right way because these two things are backwards from what they were before. Okay, so this, this is in fact correct. So minus two eta. Um, now I get the function value. So f of x t minus f of x star. Okay, so that's kind of nice. Sometimes it's nice to go all to the function value. Sometimes we're working on the gradients. Sometimes we're you know, working on the function value. Sometimes we're working on the iterates. Those are kind of the three things to be working on. Here it's kind of nice to go to the function values. Um, and then let's put a squared here. And now let's just kind of assume that away. Let's assume that these things are bounded by some constant in norm. Okay, so in some classes of problems that would be feasible and very natural. Let's just do that for here for keeping ourselves simp simple. So let's call that a g squared. Okay, so starting to get there. Um, all right, and so now we're starting to kind of get to where there's not much else to do. We want to get our telescoping sum, and then this guy, you know, kind of we want, we care about how the function values are evolving, so, so let's now reveal that. So let's pull this over to this side, and so we get that f of x t minus f of x star, because that's kind of sub that's an optimality gap in terms of the function values. Okay, so it might be one of the things you would care about, that you want to get an output eventually that's close to the best output you can give in terms of f. What, now, in other cases, you might care about how far is x to x star. I'm not doing that here. I'm doing just the function values because that's what this simple analysis gives me. Um, so I got that. And then I've divided through by 2 eta uh, less than or equal to 1 over 2 eta. And then I'm going to get the telescoping sum stuff xt minus x star squared minus xt plus 1 minus x star squared. And then I'm going to get this uh, plus eta over 2g squared. OK. All right, and now um, to do the telescoping, just sum over t. And then let's go ahead and divide by capital T. Um, so I get 1 over t. Um, Okay, and then when it telescopes, uh, two eta, now I divide it by t. Um, you all, if you uh, don't know how to kind of do this in your head, uh, do it at lunch, because it's kind of really important that you do it. When you, when you add this over t, obviously you're going to get a plus t and a minus t. Um, as t increments, those will cancel. So you'll just get the one in the beginning and the one at the end. You'll get the one in the beginning with just a positive sign, you'll get the one at the end with a negative sign. Okay, so you'll get uh, x1 minus x star squared, and you'll get then minus x capital T plus 1 minus x star squared. Um, okay, so we're basically kind of done. So. Um, now it just depends on little kind of tricks of the trade often, and kind of cleaning up afterwards and recognizing terms and simplifying and blah, blah, blah. So the first thing we're going to do is that when we have a negative of something positive and we don't have any control over that, well, let's just uh, drop that and we're going to still get a, a further inequality. It'll just only make it bigger. Okay, so less than or equal to, and we're dropping that term. So that's very common. I kind of a little term at the end that you don't know how to handle, you just drop it. That term is less than or equal to r squared by my assumption. So I'm making lots of assumptions here. 
Um, all right, and now what more can I do with this? That's kind of a little ugly. And so what I'm going to do is um, um, use uh, Jensen's inequality here. So I can, this is the average of the f, f values. It's a convex function, so that's greater than or equal to f of the average. So I'll get something looking a little prettier, which is that f of the average iterate minus the optimal value you can achieve, all right, is, um, and then uh, plus 1 over 2, or sorry, what, what am I doing? That is less than or equal to um, r squared over 2 eta t plus 8 over 2 g squared, okay? All right, and now you're kind of home free because you hopefully will recognize I've got an eta here above and below, so I get kind of a classical trade-off. I could set eta to, to trade off those two terms and find an optimal eta. And if you'll just do that, you can do it with calculus. Just take derivative with respect to eta and minimize with respect to eta, and you will get that eta should scale as uh, 1 over square root of t. So if I now plug that back in, so it's really scaling as that. There's a constant I'm omitting. So this means that we're now, uh, you know, the performance of the average iterate, uh, which is one particular output you consider, probably not the best one, but the simplest analysis I could possibly give, is, and if I just do the, the algebra, it's less than or equal to r squared plus g squared over 2 squared of t. All right, so there you go. There's your first, if you haven't seen these kind of things before, your first full analysis of an algorithm making lots of assumptions, but it's a very weak algorithm. Um, we're not making any assumptions about f other than it's convex, so it could be the absolute value function. This analysis would work for that. All right, um, and uh, we get a rate. So this is a rate. And it's, a, it's an upper bound. It's an upper bound. We might ask also for lower bounds here. What's the best you could do with any algorithm? Does anybody know what the lower bound is it known? Is there a known lower bound for this class of problems? Convex function, you're only allowed to use subgradients. One over root t. So this, this algorithm. R squared plus, right? Oh, it's r times g? Really? OK. Well, you plug it back in, yeah. OK, thank you. Better. And there's no factor. And there's no factor two. Oh, I like my factor of two. All right, never mind. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, so anyway, it's uh, some constant that arose from some of my strong assumptions. But the key is that. And moreover, there is an analysis, the kind of Nemirovsky-style analysis that shows this is actually, a, it matches a lower bound. 1 over square root of t is the best you can do in this class of problems. So that's kind of cool. Um, all right, now a lot of things you would want to do from here. First of all, you'd like to say, well, I don't want to only worry about the average iterate. I don't want to keep around all the, the average. I want the last iterate. And you can do that here. It's not that hard. I just didn't want to, uh, at this early stage, fill the board with a lot of more stuff. Um, but you can do that. Um, but when you get into more advanced classes of problems, like the extra gradient sort of things, getting uh, bounds for the average iterate is pretty easy. And for the last iterate, it's hard and maybe even impossible. Okay, Averaging makes things easier. Other things you might want to do is you might care about this. You might want to bound that. How far am I away from the, the, the uh, you know, do I, am I outputting the right answer? And, you know, that's a different analysis. Okay, not much harder, but a different analysis. And so on and so forth. So you can, and there's different kinds of criteria you can envisage, and they've all been worked on on this level of the, of the literature. They've all been worked on. Um, all right, but without making very many other assumptions. Of course, then you can start to get rid of some of these assumptions like this. Uh, it's not that easy, though, to get rid of that and also to get rid of this, because this algorithm um, is, is, um, is, in fact, it's kind of interesting just to write down, if it's, if it's a nice smooth contours, you, it'll be descent. But if you have some sharp contours, you can actually kind of step across to the other side and go up. Okay, so, so say that I'm in a convex set, you'd have to kind of prove that. You stay in a convex set, and that's not, not immediate. Um, all right, so that, uh, we're going to do some analyses of this style. We'll probably do a few more, and I, but I'm going to kind of just wave my hands at various points here. Uh, there, uh, um, and I guess the other point I want to make about this result is that um, what's missing, what, what's not present there that's kind of nice and surprising? What other constant is in this problem that I didn't even mention? Huh? 
No initial points in the R. Dimension. dimension. Yeah. Right? We, we're thinking about these high dimensional problems. Dimension of the x vector. Let's call that n. All right? It's in there, all right? Uh, but it's not. And so this is a beautiful fact, is that this algorithm is independent dimension. You can run this in infinite dimensions, and it'll take just as many steps as it does in finite dimensions. That's a kind of amazing. Now, R includes D, yes. Yeah, no. So when you start to get into this field, you get immediate pushback on statements like that. Um, and you should, because there is, you know, you don't want to cheat, because you're going to put something, pull something out here and put it back in here. There's no free lunches here. There's just things that work, you know. Uh, but nonetheless, this is important, all right, that in high dimensions, these gradients, so the gradient, this is just about the gradient, really. The gradient is kind of this magical thing. It, it's kind of pushing you in a nice direction. Naively, you might think, okay, I'm in some high dimensional space. Let's suppose I calculate all the derivatives along all the axes, and I'm only allowing myself to go out some, some fixed amount, okay? This is kind of like the prox kind of operator, all right? And so which direction should I go? to go downhill the most, all right? And we all know the answer, but the naive thing in your brain tells you you should do, pick the biggest bang for your buck. You should pick the direction that has got the biggest change and put all of your energy there, all right? But that's not correct. The gradient is the best direction, and what the gradient is doing is taking a little bit of some direction and something, a little bit of some other direction which has less of a partial derivative. That seems weird, right? But it's the magic of gradient ascent that it's not weird. Okay. And of course, it has to do with the Euclidean geometry here and the quadratic. Uh, but it is, you should pause for a minute if, you know, if your intuition sort of suggests you should you know, go along the direction with the biggest change in the, act, in the coordinate axes, that's wrong. All right, and this is a consequence of that fact. All right, so now how am I doing, Lanka? Time-wise. You just tell me when I when, when stop? Now? Okay. I'm stopped. 